Lei Homa, how are you? Welcome to Cantonese and Toy San Society, celebrating and spreading heritage and language. Let's learn Cantonese and Toy Sanese, the Chinese dialects spoken in many Chinese communities worldwide. The Cantonese Toy Sanese people are settled in Guangdong, China, Macau, Ngomun, Hong Kong, Southeast Asian countries, Africa, Europe, Latin American countries, Canada, and the United States. There are many Cantonese and Toy Sanese speakers in New York City's Chinatown, Flushing, Queens, yes, Flushing too, and other parts of Queens, and as well as Brooklyn. They are settled in Bensonhurst, Bay Ridge, 8th Avenue, and Avenue U. Because of the widespread use of Cantonese as well as Hong Kong Cantonese TV programs and radio stations and movies available, other Chinese groups take interest in learning Cantonese and many do master speaking Cantonese. This program has been created to pay homage to the Cantonese and Toy Sanese ancestors who contributed to the building of the United States Transcontinental Railroad and Canadian Railroads, as well as to celebrate and spread Cantonese and Toy Sanese dialects. Despite experiencing discrimination and racism in the 1800s, they persevered and developed Chinese communities worldwide and introduced Chinese culture to the world. Cantonese and Toy Sanese dialects, as well as all other Chinese dialects, deserve much credit and recognition and deserve to be passed on to the next generation. So if you know people who speak Cantonese and or Toy Sanese, whether they are your friend, your partner, neighbor, client, patient, customer, or co-workers, or if you just happen to love Chinese culture, come learn Cantonese and or Toy Sanese. They are fun dialects to learn and I make it Fun and simple to learn. So have fun saying lei hou ma to your Chinese friend. Okay now, thank you very much. Mm, goi sai. And remember, it's okay to ask your friend to teach you Cantonese or Toy Sanese. Mm, goi sai. Thank you very much. So here are a few phrases in Cantonese and Toy Sanese. In Cantonese, to say how are you is lei hou, lei hou. Or lei hou ma, lei hou ma. Can you repeat after me? Lei hou or lei hou ma. Not to say thank you or excuse me, like you want to catch the waiter's attention at a Chinese restaurant. You would say excuse me, and also thank you would be um goi, um goi. Now can you repeat after me or look at your friend or your mother, or your father, and say um goi. Goi. Now to say thank you very much or thank you for everything would be goi sai, goi sai. So I'm gonna say it faster now, okay? Goi sai, goi sai. So can you repeat after me? Goi sai, goi sai. That's when you really want to show your appreciation and really thank them. So you would say goi sai. Now to say to see you next time would be ha chikin. Ha chikin. Now in Toy Sanese, hoi sang wa. To say how are you would be, ni ho ma, ni ho ma. Can you repeat after me? Ni ho ma. To say thank you would be, o te, o te. So if you go to a store, a Chinese store in Chinatown, especially New York City's Chinatown. Like in the streets of Ma Street, Elizabeth Street, Bayer Street, and many others, you can say o te, o te. To say long time no see would be mang gen ho kyu, mang gen ho kyu. This is a motto I made to honor and remember my Cantonese Toy Sanese ancestors who contributed in the building of the United States Transcontinental and Canadian Railroads. And paved the way for all Chinese people today. Many of them endured racial attacks and died during the construction of the railroad. Cantonese and Toy San Society has been created to ensure that we do not forget what the early settlers have done for this country. If you are of Cantonese and/or Toy Sanese descent, 
appreciate your heritage and mother tongue. They are dialects that deserve to be recognized and passed on to the next generation, whether it is made the official dialect of China or not. Love Cantonese Toisan heritage. Kai chok gong, gong dong hoi san wa, do zhe, o de. If you would like to learn more Cantonese and Toisanese, you are welcome to join our free Cantonese and Toisanese language classes. You can visit our website, Cantonese Toisan Society dot blogspot dot com. Again, Cantonese Toisan T O I S A N Society dot blogspot dot com. Mgoi sai, do zhe. Thank you. native speaker. Uh, I, I came to New York a few years ago and uh, I met my wife who's from Hong Kong and uh, because of that I wanted to learn Cantonese and that's uh, how I started looking for uh, Cantonese classes. And the challenge definitely is the, the tone system which does not exist in the other languages I speak. Uh, so I have to train my ear and my, uh, my uh, mouth to pronounce these tones. Homa means uh, how are you. Uh, don't say means thank you. Actually, I try to speak Cantonese when I go to buy some uh, bok choy in Chinatown, and uh, other, when I go buy, sh you know, food for, for uh, cooking. Mm, great. And I, I must say, I get a, a very, a very nice welcome. Uh, people are very uh, grateful for me trying to speak Cantonese. Oh, good. Okay, thank you. All right. Hi, my name is Tony, and uh, I attend a class um, on Saturdays uh, with my friend Kit. And uh, I've been taking the class since uh, 2003. Uh, right around that time, uh, I was looking around for a place to learn uh, Cantonese, and I had some difficulty uh, finding a place. And uh, yeah, she was a great uh, source for uh, learning Cantonese because I wanted to uh, connect with my culture and uh, meet other people and speak with other people in Cantonese. And uh, you know, being a native uh, New Yorker, I didn't really get to interact with that many people. Uh, growing up in Queens. So I get to do so now every week on Saturdays. And uh, if you'd like to learn more, uh, go to cantoneseonline.org and uh, check out the class schedules. And uh, Joy Gain, I'll see you in class. First of all, my name is Corky Lee. Um, I consider myself an ABC from NYC. Now in NYC, uh, which is of course you know, New York City, but an ABC, is a American-born Chinese, right? and uh, there are a couple of other deviations of uh, what uh, other Chinese from other areas. Uh, one is a BBC, British-born Chinese. Uh, they're from um, uh, either Hong Kong or uh, before the takeover of Canada or Australia, or the former British colonies. They're a BBC. Uh, if you're from uh, Taiwan, uh, the term is known as MIT, made in Taiwan. Right? I came up with uh, the final one. Um, if you're born on the mainland, and the reason is that uh, when the Chinese on the mainland uh, Romanize uh, English, they use X, Y, and Z. So I call them X, Y, Z Chinese. Right? So I've used the entire alphabet to describe uh, four basic groups of uh, Chinese. 
Uh, but New York City, there are basically three tram terminals. Uh, the oldest uh, one is in uh, Manhattan. Um, and it's basically a, a five, seven block area in, in, um, in the shadows of uh, City Hall. Um, the second one, uh, the second oldest would be Flushing. And that's where there are a lot of um, MIT, uh, people from uh, Taiwan, uh, you know, live and congregate in their business. But there's also an expanding Korean uh, as well as uh, South Asian community there. Uh, and the third one is actually in Brooklyn, uh, pretty much in Sunset Park. I know that the census is concentrated in Sunset Park to try to uh, tabulate uh, all the planning there. So yeah, in New York City, uh, you can have uh, three tram towns. A lot of people, you know, know if you're Asian American that May has been designated as Asian Pacific Heritage Month, but not a whole lot of people know why May was designated. Uh, as a result of the bicentennial celebrations of this country in 1976, uh, congressional aid by the name of uh, Jeannie Jew realized that there were no celebrations to commemorate the contributions of Asian Pacific Americans uh, that year. And so for three years working as a congressional aide for uh, Frank Jefferson uh, Horton uh, from uh, Rochester, uh, New York, to finally get the support of Bob Matsui and Norman Mineta. Uh, so in 1979, May was designated because, number one, the Chinese completed the railroad May 10, 1869. And I believe in 1863, uh, the first Japanese immigrants arrived in the United States. So those are the two primary reasons why May was designated. Um, I like to do a major exhibit because uh, I'm probably um, without, you know, it, it may be arguable, but uh, I think a lot of people would agree. I'm, I'm probably the preeminent Chinese American uh, photographer that documented uh, Chinese for the last 40 years. So uh, I have um, strikes, um, protests. Um, I continue to do that. And, uh, and uh, you would think on a daily basis that I have to have a, a day job which I have to use to pay my rent. So um, whenever there's you know, something new, going on, I try to make a point of you know, uh, getting a catalog together. And um, hopefully by the end of the year, or uh, uh, before the end of the year, I'll have a, a retrospective uh, photographic work of my 40 years. As uh, people don't realize, there are other you know, Chinese communities or Chinatowns in the United States. Uh, in addition to New York, is uh, the oldest one is uh, San Francisco. Uh, and the second largest, uh, up until probably the turn of uh, the 20th century is uh, Portland, Oregon. Uh, but you also had L.A. L.A. had like three locations of the Chinatowns. They were actually ostracized and, and, and burned out of uh, one Chinatown and they moved into another. Seattle on, on the west coast you know, had a Chinatown. But you also had uh, Chinatowns uh, on the east coast in addition to New York. You had Boston, you had Philadelphia, you had Washington, D.C. Uh, you also had Baltimore and as well as Newark. Uh, both in Newark and uh, Baltimore, uh, demise uh, during, due to uh, unfavorable uh, laws you know, for restaurants. Uh, in one case in Baltimore, they would not allow Chinese restaurants to use uh, bamboo chopsticks. They had to convert to use plastic chopsticks. They said there was a health reason uh, for that. Um, in uh, Newark, Chinatown, it was populated by Chinese who actually worked for Thomas Edison, who invented not only the light bulb, but um, elements of the uh, movie industry as we know uh, today. Uh, those Chinese, when they went back to China, started the movie industry in Canton. As a matter of fact, when uh, the railroad was completed, uh, those Chinese who could save enough money built the first railroad from Canton to Toy Sun. Uh, so they laid down the track and bought a locomotive, and, and the first railroad in China uh, was from Canton to Toy Sun, about 90 miles of the distance. Uh, but in uh, places like uh, Chicago, there's actually two Chinatowns uh, in Chicago. Now, uh, in the 21st century, the one in the Chinatown in the north is more populated by South uh, East Asians. But the older Chinatown is, is in uh, the south, and not too far from um, Barack Obama's you know, favorite baseball team, Chicago White Sox. So it's one subway stop away. Um, but uh, the, the newer Chinatowns are in uh, Las Vegas, there's one in uh, Houston, there's even one in Miami. Um, 
So uh, wherever there's a flux in the fall of time, um, that happens. When I was in junior high school, uh, every junior high school kid you know, reads social studies, whether you like it or not. You first find out that the Chinese built the transcontinental railroad and it completed, as I said, in uh, 1869. Uh, but it was uh, much more dangerous you know, uh, work than uh, you know, realized. Uh, the U.S. government, uh, this is uh, Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, he's the guy on the $20 bill, just in case you're not familiar with Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, he also accepted the surrender of the Confederacy. Um, he um, uh, basically uh, gave money, uh, the government paid money to have the railroad built. Uh, they want to do it again for the 21st century. They, they want bullet trains going across the country. Uh, so that was about 150 years ago. Uh, but the, the company that uh, built the railroad using Chinese labor, they were paid $48,000 a mile uh, because it went through mountainous terrain. Uh, if you went through a level um, uh, grassland area, they only paid 12000 Now, there's a term called maritime stamp. They would use uh, dynamite to blast uh, their way through the Sierra Nevada. Uh, and that term, maritime stamp, uh, is basically predicated on the fact that they had to lower the individuals in wicker baskets to light the fuses. Now, dynamite was something that was uh, very new at the time, but uh, they didn't have the technology to match the fuses to the dynamite. So sometimes these uh, gunpowder fuses would burn slowly, and sometimes they would burn really fast. So the Chinese were paid like an extra dollar uh, for you know, lighting the fuse successfully and then filling uh, them out, backed up. But if you were blown to smithereens, that's where the term Nara Chinese stamps comes in, into play. Um, and thousands of Chinese uh, worked on the railroad, uh, up to about 12,000 at uh, the highest point, but probably about 1,000 uh, Chinese uh, uh, died you know, trying to complete this, uh, the first major engineering feat. It would be the equivalent of uh, building an Eiffel Tower in, in, in Paris. There were, you know, throughout history, there's been an anti uh, Chinese sentiment. Uh, and uh, the Chinese were the first group to be legislated not to come into the United States, and this happened in 1882. And that was not, uh, the, the uh, restrictions were not uh, relaxed until after the Second World War, because China and the United States were allies during the Second World War. Um, but it wasn't until 1965, 20 years after the war ended, that the Chinese were allowed to, uh, to enter uh, in a more relaxed fashion, and the families could uh, reunite uh, with other members, uh, and um, that's where the, the, a lot more Chinese came in, and that was basically to uh, maintain the U.S. policy of the containment uh, bamboo curtain of China. They didn't want communism to spread beyond the borders of China. Uh, there was a famine in the southern part of China in the early days of it, uh, the People's Republic of China, and uh, probably about three, four million people were swarmed into Hong Kong. So. But that is also at the height of the civil rights movement in this country. And my belief is that uh, they allow the Chinese to come in as a source of cheap labor to counterbalance uh, African Americans you know, demanding their rights as, as, uh, as people and as citizens. So as long as they could have uh, capitalism have a, a form of cheap labor, you can continue becoming capitalist. But uh, those are uh, the initial wars. And, uh, the Chinese were uh, the, the first ones to have wars enacted against them. Uh, throughout their history, the, every time there was an economic uh, depression or recession, you know, uh, the Chinese were, were blamed for it, just like uh, the Jews were blamed for things in uh, Europe. Uh, you couldn't intermarry uh, up until probably, the, I think it was the 60s, uh, if I recall correctly. Uh, and uh, all the money that was raised from uh, these taxes on miners, Chinese miners, during uh, post, you know, gold rush of 1849, uh, went to build what we know today as, a, as, as Berkeley, the University of California at Berkeley. You know, those buildings were paid by Chinese uh, mining taxes. Yeah, there was uh, at one point uh, after uh, Zhang He sailed uh, the Seven Seas, and he sailed uh, the Seven Seas with uh, uh, a fleet and an army that uh, numbered like 10,000. Uh, and uh, records indicate that he probably had close to 100 ships. And that's certainly um, uh, 97 more than Christopher Columbus with the Ma Nina Pinta and the Santa Maria. And his ships were uh, actually carried livestock. So but it was like seven voyages. It could be like the seven voyages of Sinbad. 
but uh, there's a, a very little documentation left, but it's a historical fact that uh, this guy uh, sailed the seven seas, and um, but after he came back to China, they had an imperial edict that no Chinese could leave China. If he came back, he was beheaded. Okay, but because of the uh, economic and uh, conditions in the southern part of China, primarily uh, Khoisan, uh, a lot of these Chinese you know, went elsewhere to, to find a livelihood to send money back. Uh, the Chinese, these same Chinese, the Khoisanese, one went to Malaysia, they went to the Philippines, uh, Singapore, um, and so forth. Um, but it was a, basically a major necessity. And there's always, the South is always rebellious, just like the Confederacy is for the United States. Because uh, Nanking and, and Beijing now is in the North. So there's like the North versus the South. Um, the, um, the influence and the rise of uh, martial arts uh, um, actually starts from, from the South. Um, uh, Bruce Lee's you know, techniques you know, actually came from uh, pretty much the uh, one uh, temple in the South, these um, Shaolin monks uh, came from the South. So there was always a, a rebellious attitude towards you know, the people in the North. Uh, so they're the ones that left. They are the same ones that uh, helped build the railroad because around that time, uh, between 1850 and 1870, uh, 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 it was uh, 1865, 1850 and 1865, that was the, the period of uh, civil unrest known as the Tyson Rebellion. When the rebellion was uh, finally suppressed by people from the North, a lot of these guys you know, had to go elsewhere. They became political, they were the first Chinese political refugees, right? And uh, the Chinese were subjugated to the point that they had to uh, braid their hair really long. So, but uh, in fighting the Civil War, these guys cut their hair short. So, if you cut your hair short and you had this imperial edict, you couldn't go back to China. So, the same uh, Toysonese actually helped uh, cement and support financially the revolution of 1911 that brought in Dr. Sun Yat Sen. Uh-huh. 38 years old in America. It's my first trip. You've never been back. No. Inside the boat, Jimmy recruited workers for his restaurants. You want to go to New York? <laughs> How much are you going to pay these guys? I pay them a uh, coolie wage. Coolie wage. <laughs> Plus food. What in the world are you doing? This is my homeland. I have to take off my socks. I walk in my homeland with my bare feet. No shoes on, no socks on. Look familiar? No. Nothing look, nothing look the same. Everything new. Strange place. Uh, we're going to my home where I was born. Why did you come back at this particular time? The main reason I came back to China after 38 years it's because of this, it's my daughter. And she passed away five years ago when she was 16. Before she died, Jimmy promised his daughter that he'd return to his hometown with a lock of her hair. I dropped some of them off here, so, and she's here forever. And that's where she came from. Welcome home, Jimmy. This is my baby carriage. It's amazing. It's still very good shape. Who's that, Jimmy? My great grandfather. Yeah, what did he do? What was his job? He constructed railroads in America. Railroad 999 from the West Coast to the East Coast. Jimmy ended his visit with a prayer for his daughter. It's hard to believe your cousin's almost the same age as you. Uh, Life been hard? I hope we have a better China in the future become democracy. Today is June the 4th. Uh, something happened in Peking. I'm not happy to hear that. But God bless everybody. Toysan is officially called the home of the overseas Chinese. We found out why. Who has relatives in the United States? You do. Everybody. Everybody has relatives in the United States. What city in the United States? Boston. Boston. The city's built a statue welcoming back overseas relatives. 
but what they really welcome is the money. Chinese from Hong Kong and America have invested heavily. This is the largest textile factory in Asia. What percentage of the investment here is overseas Chinese money? 30%. Uh -huh. Are you afraid that the troubles in Beijing are going to scare investors away? No. Things are stable here. No trouble here. Where did all these machines come from? From the United States. What are you making with these machines? Blue jeans for America? Down the road from the factory, we heard there was a former restaurant owner who was a bit unusual. Hi. My name is Tommy. Where are you from? Uh, right here. Seattle? Right, to Seattle. And what in the world are you doing in China? Trying to make a living. Doing what? Oh, agriculture. Orange. How much land do you actually own? From left here, and all the way down to the ditches, and all the way down to all the tall tree. All that's your land? All is my land. And now what, you're the largest land, private landowner in China? I would think so. They call you the Orange King. How many trees have you planted? About approximately about 100,000. Really? Big one and small one. Uh-huh. Now, yeah. if you make money from this, yes. who gets to keep the money? Me. <laughs> what do they grow in their time? Tea. Wulong tea. Wulong tea? <laughs> That's your field also? That's my field, yes. Uh -huh. How much money does Tommy pay you? He pays you about a dollar a day. Uh huh. And you same? Same money? About a dollar a day. What happens if they don't really work hard for you? Can you fire them? Do you have the right to fire them? Yes. We can fire them anytime, anywhere. Uh huh. Yes. So Tommy, who owns the pond? I own the pond. Own the fish? I own the fish too, yes. How many pigs do you have? So far, right now, we have about 600. When you told your family, listen, I got an idea. I'm going to China, and I'm going to start to grow oranges. You know what they say? You are crazy. I'm not going. You had to go alone. That's what I did. Really? I'm all alone here. Tommy refused to talk politics, but despite the events in Beijing, he said he wouldn't leave. He's just built himself a two-story house. Now, you've started your farm here. You can make a lot of money. You think Chairman Mao's rolling around in his grave right now if he saw this? Well, that was past. Mao's new now. Either he likes it or he don't. Not much he can do.